resurrection and I am the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His compassion never fails. Every morning they are renewed. Jesus said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. 
I'm sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. We brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The eternal God is our refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. In the midst of life, we are in death. From whom can we seek help? From you alone, O Lord, who by our sins are justly angered. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. Lord, you know the secrets of our hearts. Shut not your ears to our prayers, but spare us, O Lord. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and mortal one, have mercy upon us. O worthy and eternal judge, do not let the pains of death turn us away from you at our last hour. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. With faith in Jesus Christ, we received the body of our brother Courtney for burial. Our brother was washed in holy baptism and anointed with the Holy Spirit. Let us therefore with confidence pray to God, our Heavenly Father, the giver of life, that he will raise him to perfection in the company of the saints. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother Courtney. We thank you for giving him to us, his family and friends, to know and love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord. May he rest in peace. We sing the hymn, Angel Voices Ever Singing. be seated. I take this early opportunity to extend a cordial welcome to all, to express 
sincere condolences to the members of the Blackman family. I pray that the service will be a source of comfort to you as we reflect on Sir Courtney's life and celebrate his legacy. May you find this church, the type of church where you're comforted and affirmed in your respective endeavors. To the governor of the Central Bank, Mr. Haynes, other mem members of the staff of the Central Bank, all other distinguished persons, I bid you welcome. And may God comfort us all in this service. I offer an apology on behalf of the Honorable Prime Minister, the Honorable Mayor Moore Motley, who paid her last respect by visiting before the start of the service, but regrets very much that she is unable to stay for the duration of the service on account of attending to other matters pertaining to the state. I'm certain we understand the nature of such responsibilities, but she assures you, the family, of her best wishes and prayers. So we regret the absence of the Prime Minister, and I offer sincere apologies for her absence. I now invite Mr. Haynes to present words of remembrance, the Governor of the Central Bank. Good morning. Today, I'm deeply humbled to pay tribute on behalf of past governors of the Central Bank of Barbados, members of the local and regional central banking community, past and present, and my family to support the Newlands Blackman, who, as its first governor, laid the foundation for the bank as a highly respected institution at home and abroad. I think it's important to note that at the time of his appointment in 1972, he was only 39 and the world's youngest central bank governor. For the next 15 years, he excelled. And in pursuit of his vision for the bank, to be a set, for the bank as a center of excellence, created an institution whose work was highly, widely heralded by the investment made in human capital development the promotion of institutional strengthening, and the encouragement of the bank's involvement in national economic and financial affairs. So Courtney's list of achievements at the bank are numerous. I just want to highlight a few this morning. He oversaw the introduction of Barbados's national currency in 1973, and was intimately involved in the July 1975 decision based on the instability of the British pound to tie the island's currency to the United States dollar at a rate of two Barbados dollars to one US dollar, a peg that every Barbadian guards and defends dearly to this day as the pillar of our economic stability. Before there was a Ministry of International Business, he facilitated a prominent role for the bank in the nurturing and helping to grow or international business and financial services industry into Barbados' second largest foreign exchange earner. He promoted the complementarity between the international business and tourism, and devoted considerable human and financial resources to this very important industry. So Courtney shepherded the island through recession during the early 1980s, facing at times severe criticisms for his call for wage restraint from politicians and trade unions. He also faced intense criticism for the construction of the bank's headquarters across the way, deemed as too costly at the time. But with characteristic resoluteness and steadfastness, he defended his stance against the public chaffing. In the words of the late US General Douglas MacArthur, and I quote, he had the confidence to stand alone the courage to make tough decisions, and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. He also firmly believed that the bank should be involved in the community in which it served to inspire hope and confidence among the people. 
His insistence, therefore, on gifting a performance art space to Barbados was outside the realm of central banking. Today, the Frank Kalama Hall remains Barbados's premier center for the performing arts. To perform there is an honor for artists, and its rich legacy is one that all successive governors have been keen to maintain. Socorny's contribution to the bank should not be limited to the economic policies that he crafted or the physical structures that he championed. As he reminded me one day after he left the bank, central banking is an intellectual exercise. He recruited, sometimes on his own initiative, individuals whom he believed would fulfill this task. He insisted that they should be well qualified, educated, and informed. He therefore encouraged and supported our pursuits of academic qualifications, promoted and backed our attendance at educational events, and created opportunities for international exposure. This allowed many of us to sharpen our skills, grow our competencies, and acquire global capital. And he did not worry about us seeking greener pastures after such training and development. His was the view that he was developing citizens for the world. Our staff, many of them retired, laud and thank him for his foresight and interest in their personal and professional development. We appreciate the many doors that he opened for us within and outside of the bank. This interest in staff extended to our children, many of whom he knew by name. Even after he left the bank, he would walk around the institution whenever he visited, inquiring about everyone's well-being, engaging them in light banter, and as you would appreciate, cracking many a joke. His presence when he was in town, sorry. We always felt his presence when he was in town, and we certainly heard his booming laughter that resonated across the headquarters building. I think at heart he was a teacher, probably wanted to be a cricketer first, but he was a teacher. And to be in his presence was a learning experience, as his every utterance drew on his accumulated wisdom and encyclopedic knowledge. I recall submitting an article for publication early in my career. He summoned me to his office to discuss it further. And his critique was less about what was in the article and more about what was not. He certainly opened new vistas to my thinking that day. In the same vein, public education was a hallmark of his. To him, an informed public underpinned by in for a country's economic policy and redounded to a society's high performance. He therefore invested much effort, energy, and financial resources in the bank's education and public relations campaign. Many of those programs started under his leadership live on today not because the bank has not adapted, but more so because he had demonstrated so much foresight and relevance. The quarterly news conferences, our Economist Annual Review Seminar, a forum in which our researchers present their work for their peer scrutiny, the Sir Winston Scott Memorial Lecture, and the numerous financial and economic conferences that we hold are all part of this legacy. He felt justly proud when Barbadians could speak to economic issues or quote from the central bank's publications because of the bank's public engagement. At his peak, he bestrode the world like a colossus, defending Barbados's interests with every sinew in his body, both as governor and through the many roles he occupied after his departure in 1987. A leader extraordinaire, a visionary, a central banker par excellence, and a believer in huma humanity, the accolades that he has received were all well earned. That former Prime Minister Owen Arthur was moved to describe the bank as, and I quote, the Barbadian institution of the 20th century speaks to the impact of Sir Courtney's stewardship. As I conclude, allow me to paraphrase the words of the English poet Rudyard Kipling to capture the essence of who Sir Courtney was. Sir Courtney walked with the crowd and kept his virtue he walked with kings and did not lose the common touch. All men counted with him, but none too much. To Lady Blackman, his sons, Keith, Chris, and Martin, his grands and siblings, and all who mourn his loss, the bank expresses its profound condolences.
And I invite the Blackman Sons to present words of remembrance. Christopher, Keith Christopher and Martin Blackman. Good morning, everybody. Uh, first of all, thank you, Governor Haynes, for those wonderful words. Our family will always cherish the way you and Mrs. Haynes and the Central Bank staff have supported us, particularly our mother. And a special shout out to Novaline Brewster, who's been there every step of the way um, along this uh, often sad journey. Um, we also want to give thanks, obviously, to Prime Minister Motley. We were so pleased to see her here this morning. My mother actually taught her in Queens College, and um, I know that was something that my mother really treasured and cherished. Um, also, a special thanks to um, Philippe. I see our cousin Philippe and Mary Alex, who flew in a couple days ago and had to do two COVID tests two days in a row. Thank you for taking that quick turnaround trip. Uh, we want to take a special shout out to Mr. Richard Edchill and Liz Robinson for everything that they've done to support our mother as well. Thank you so much for being here. And also, our, our father now goes to join his parents and join his sister, Hazel. And we see here as well, we see Aunt Pauline there, his sister, uh, Janice, his sister, Uncle Wally is here, represented by our Aunt Shirley. Um, and did I, um, and Aunt Jean in Montreal, who couldn't be here. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here. I know that he's looking down on his siblings, whom he cherished and loved. Um, also, I, th I think our, our hope here this morning is to celebrate our father's life. We want to hasten the time when the memories of our father brings smiles to our faces before tears to our eyes. I think we've, we, we want to start that journey today. Uh, fittingly, it's two days before Father's Day, and I think today will mark that step towards that, that time. So to begin, Martin and Chris and I want to share a couple of stories that shine a light on who our father was. Uh, go a little bit beyond the bio and the obituaries. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about my father's words of wisdom and encouragement over the years. And I think the strength of his legacy is that those words continue to live on in our, in our children. Uh, Cyril and Camille and Helen and Danny, Mia and Hannah, Matthew and Caroline have all heard these words that you're about to hear from our lips. Um, let me start with education. Chris and I and Martin were really taken yesterday with how many of the bank staff came up to us and mentioned the fact that my father had encouraged through educational pursuits. And that was, that was who he was. Um, my father um, placed a huge importance on the process of education and acquiring knowledge for knowledge's sake. Um, I think back to occasions when Chris and I would return from Harrison College and ecstatically declare to our father, um, we have no homework tonight, only to have that joy extinguished by an admonition from our father. What do you mean you have no homework? There is always homework to do. But daddy, the teacher didn't assign anything. Well then, read around the subject. That was an admonition. I, I, my, my kids to this day hear, hear that. Um, Self-improvement. Um, heaven help Chris and I and Martin if our father ever got a sense that we were wasting our time, not using our time wisely. If during summer we were lazying away and not doing much of anything by way of intellectual pursuits. And I think, uh, I think back to the times when he would ask us, what are you doing to add to your human capital? And to young boys who were not yet conversant in the language of economics or business, this was a little bit of a head scratcher. What do you mean, human capital? But one summer he handed me Rachel Carson's seminal work on the 
environment, Silent Spring. And he made sure that throughout the summer I gave him regular reports on what each of the chapters were about. And we understood very quickly that adding to your human capital meant expanding your knowledge. That's, that's all he wanted us to do, to find opportunities to expand our knowledge. Also, he was great at encouraging us, lifting our spirits. Uh, one summer when Chris and I were about nine, we began taking entrance exams for private schools in New York, which struck fear in our hearts and fear that we would disappoint our parents with subpar results. But Daddy, sensing our trepidation one day as we were on our way to one such test, looked at us before we entered the room and said, do your best, and then to heck with it. And that, that abated our nerves quickly. He always had that right touch. He always sensed when words of wisdom and encouragement were, were, were needed. And dare I say, that day we performed quite well in that exam. Um, dealing with disappointment, you all know that we were a tennis playing family. And I remember one day when Chris and I had lost a doubles match in an important junior tournament. I'm sure Sydney re remembers this. And I have to mention Sydney. Um, <laughs> Sydney was someone that our father considered his fourth son, our, our, our brother. And so we had a lot of battles on the court with Sydney. And one day in particular, we lost a, a, a really important doubles match after squandering many opportunities and we were inconsolable on the car ride home, close to tears. And those tears were quickly dried with some sage words and timely words from Daddy, who looked at us and says, all you can do is prepare for next time. That match is ancient his history now. Um, so again, we were assuaged. We were, okay, let's, let's do this. And speaking of ancient history, let me end with one last tribute to my father's respect for education and knowledge, for knowledge's sake. And it surrounds what Chris Martin and I are doing right now, which is delivering a, a eulogy. No doubt my father at this point would have reminded us, you know, I studied classics um, in school, including Greek. And did you know that the word eulogy, do you know what it really means? is derived from the classical Greek you for well or true and logia for words or text. So boys, taken together, it means praise in a speech or writing that is in praise of a person. Oh, thank you, Daddy, I didn't know that. And no, no doubt that would lead to him accounting a story that my mother told us on their return to Barbados from a central bank meeting in Greece. Apparently, while on a tour of ancient grounds associated with the Battle of Thermopylae, my father stunned the Greek tour guide by stopping and reciting in perfect Greek the epic poem that reads in part, O stranger, go tell the Spartans that here we lie obedient to their laws. So another example of how his thirst for knowledge served him at a really opportune moment. And with that, I'm going to cede the floor to my brother Martin to continue our remembrances. Good morning and welcome everybody. I'm going to try to get through this. Um, three months ago when we had a service in Orlando, I didn't quite make it all the way through, but uh, I think with all the, the love and the friendship that's in this beautiful cathedral, um, I'll be able to do that. Um, Doc, uh, Governor Haynes, um, I want to echo the sentiments of my brother uh, to thank you and your wife and Novaline and the staff um, for your incredible kindness um, over the course of the last three months. Um, I want to say how much of a blessing it is to have our Barbadian side of the family here, Daddy's sisters. Looking forward to seeing Uncle Wally at the burial. Um, a huge thank you to Mrs. Robinson and Mr. Agile for their kindness and for everybody who made the time to come this morning. Um, Governor, you, your tribute was, was eloquent and, and fitting. 
And one of the things I, I want to make sure that I note is all of the accomplishments of my father um, and the way that he was able to impact this country and the people that he interacted with um, were all built on the support and love and guidance and advice of my mother. Um, and uh, mommy, I can't thank you enough um, for what you've done for our entire family. Um, I know how hard the last five or six years has been and um, hopefully you, you can feel the love and um, that this is part of the process to moving forward and honoring daddy's memory. Um, I've got three very short memories um, that I want to share with you. Um, and all of them were confirmed yesterday when I met everyone who came to the visitation um, and shared their, their comments and their memories about my father. Um, and they, kind of, they fall into three themes, love, service, and excellence. Um, the first is excellence. Um, I went through a phase where I, I wanted to save the world before I had a degree. I think I wanted to join the Peace Corps, um, become a social worker, um, what have you. And I was discussing it with my father. And my father said, that's very good, Martin, but remember, you can't help anybody unless you're good at something. <laughs> and I think that's something that we, we've, we've all heard the ripple of that message um, here in Barbados and, and in our family. Um, secondly is dedication to family, uh, a devoted husband, a loving father. I remember going through a tough time in my junior year where I kind of got off track and my grades were, were plummeting. I was a little too focused on tennis and not focused enough on, on school. And I was at an academy in Florida and my father took two weeks off of work to come to Florida and make sure that I did about six or seven hours of homework a day for two weeks to get my GPA up. Um, that was 35 years ago. Uh, that was before the internet, before cell phones. And to make that sacrifice in a job of that importance uh, tells you how much he valued his family. And then lastly, um, you know, one of the things that frustrated our brothers on many occasions is whenever we were driving home from something and daddy passed the house of a family member or a friend or god forbid it was raining and he saw a lady at the bus stop standing in the rain we knew that we were going to stop and give that lady a ride to wherever she was going we knew that we were going to stop and say hi to our family and friends, uh, regardless of the time and regardless of the schedule. And again, that speaks to the love and the compassion and the fact that my father always put people first. And so with that, I just wanna thank everyone who came here today. We appreciate it. We appreciate your kindness and your love. And I'm gonna hand it over to my brother, Chris. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, before I start, I just want to reiterate what Keith said. There are three brothers. There are three brothers up here right now, but there has always been a fourth brother, um, Sidney Lopez, uh, whom my father always talked of as his fourth son. And um, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish a lot of what has happened during this visit in the past few months without Sidney's dedication. And commitment. So, Sydney, thank you, brother. Um, I'd like to. We all know what my father did, the accomplishments, and it's wonderful. And it's, it's, been, it's been so wonderful to hear the recollections and the tributes. Um, and so, what I want to talk a little bit about more is who he was and uh, what he meant to us. Starting again with four very short stories that kind of. Um, really tell you the story of who he was, uh, his humanity. Martin alluded to it, but one of the earliest lessons I remember learning from my father happened not far from here. Uh, one rainy morning as he drove us to school, uh, we would have been about 12 years old, and on this morning the rain was pouring down almost sideways. And my father noticed an elderly woman walking on the street, 
pulled over to offer her a ride to wherever she was going. And of course, as clueless preteen kids, we wondered why on earth he had to delay our trip to school. <laughs> to, um, and so after some time, uh, he dropped the lady off at her destination, not before engaging her in conversation about where she was from, who her people were, and so on. And once we were finally on the way back to school, we asked what we believed was an obvious question, which was, Daddy, did you know that lady? And he said, no. And of course we asked, then why did you stop to pick her up? And his reply was emphatic. Whenever you have the opportunity to help someone, you do it without the expectation of getting anything in return. But I guarantee you that if you live long enough, that kindness will be repaid to you. Um, he had a remarkable sense of right and wrong. And the angriest that my brother and I have ever seen my father happened um, in the late 60s in New York City when he was studying at Columbia. My brother and I had a habit of, on the way home from school, stopping at a drugstore to look around at comic books and just see what, you know, as kids will do to wander around the store. And one such day, we were, we were about 10 years old. We stopped in the store three blocks from home and the store manager, who happened to be a white man, told us that if we weren't going to buy anything, we had to leave. And we knew that that didn't seem right. We just didn't see why everyone else was looking around, why we couldn't look around. In any case, we rushed home, found our father soaking in the bathtub, and told him what had happened. And a look came over his face that we had never, ever seen before. Um, it was like a storm cloud. He popped out of the tub, um, put his clothes on, took us back to the store, and told us to point out the manager. He then proceeded to make a scene like you've never experienced, yelling at the store manager that his sons could come in there anytime they like, even if they weren't going to buy anything, and then instructed us in front of the store manager still shouting at him, boys, go look around the store right now. And every day when you come home from school, come in this store and look around for as long as you want. The store manager was speechless, and I think he in fact turned a whiter shade of pale. Um, and we were mortified and embarrassed, but I will say this, we did continue to stop in the store after school, and every time that manager saw us, he would turn and walk the other way. But that obviously, beyond, that left an indelible impression on us, on his sense of right and wrong. And I think we carried it with us to this day. Um, one of the things that we've all come to know about our father, that he, um, he loved to talk. And more than that, he loved to talk to everyone, <laughs> no matter what their sta station in life. Even if it meant that his impatient sons had to wait and wait and wait until he was finished talking to people. And then of course the inevitable time when we, he had to call us over to be, have you met my sons? These are my three boys. Um, but he talked to everyone no matter who they were. Trevor King, who um, you may have seen in the documentary piece, talked about how he would be talking to the taxi drivers, talking to anyone that walked by, just to get a sense of what their lives were all about. And um, so the lesson we learned from that is that everyone, no matter who they are, has a story worth listening to. And then finally, um, he was a proud Barbadian for oral Barbadians. He believed in Barbados and never missed a chance to express his pride in being a Barbadian. And he loved the opportunity to represent his country as ambassador. And I re recall one story that he told us about. He had been at a lunch meeting in Washington, D.C. and um, I think with a fellow Barbadian, and this person looked over another table and referred to someone as, as a white Barbadian. And my father said, no, 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 no. He's not a white Barbadian. He is a Barbadian. Our father didn't divide the world into race or color. To him, a Barbadian was a Barbadian was a Barbadian and we take that lesson with us to this day. And then, I do want to end, no tribute to our father would be complete without mentioning the woman 
who completed him, the love of his life, his confidant, his rock, our mother, Lady Gloria. Um, even in his, in his final days and months um, when he was failing, the thing that would make him perk up or respond in some way was the sound of our mother's voice or the touch of her hand. And he would reach out to her and, and, and beckon her to sit with him. Um, they met over 60 years ago on the Jamaican campus of UWE. And despite the initial reservations of her family that he was from a small island, uh, their love persevered. Um, they, would, they would have been married 63 years next month. Um, our father was never happier than when she was by his side. And I'm sure that he looks, as he looks down upon us now, his biggest concern is for her, as it always was. And um, I recall that during our turbulent teenage years, he would always implore us that if we ever got into trouble, for goodness sake, call me and not your mother. So um, with that, we'd just like to uh, close together. Yes, we want to end finally with a, with a bedtime story, believe it or not. Up until the time we were about four or five, our father would make it a habit to come into our rooms and ask us whether we were fast asleep or on the verge of sleeping, a simple question. Keith and Christopher and Martin, do you love your daddy? And our trained response through sleepy eyes was, yes, daddy. And why do you love your daddy? Because he is a good daddy. No prompting was ever needed over the passing years. We loved our father because he was a good daddy. So we want to say to daddy, rest, rest in, in peace, peace sir, daddy. sir daddy. As we have recalled called his legacy thus far, we thank God for his contribution to home and family, for his service to this nation and the world, especially to central banking and finances, for his love for cricket and support of sport, for his participation in good collegial relationships and for his love and laughter. Let us to open ourselves to God's comfort and care as we prepare to hear God's comforting words in Scripture. Let us pray. Almighty God, we remember before you today your faithful servant, Courtney, and we pray that having opened to him the gates of larger life, you will receive him more and more into your joyful service, that with all who have served you in the past, he may share in the eternal victory of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please sit for the first scripture reading. Good morning. A reading from the Book of Wisdom, chapter 3, verses 1, 5, and 9. The Destiny of the Righteous. But the souls of the righteous are in the hand of God, and no torment will ever touch them. In the eyes of the foolish they seemed to have died, and their departure was thought to be a disaster, and their going from us to be their destruction. But they are at peace. For though in the sight of others they were punished, 
their hope is fully Im full of Im immortality. Having been disciplined a little, they will receive great good because God tested them and found them worthy of himself. Those who trust in him will understand truth and the faithful will abide, by, will abide with him in love because grace and mercy are upon his holy ones. And he watches over his elect. The word of the Lord. Stand to sing the Psalm number twenty three, the Cremon version.
please sit for the second reading. Good morning to the church. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John chapter 14, verses one through six. Jesus, the way to the Father. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the word of the Lord. We stand to sing the hymn, 384, Praise to the Lord the Almighty.
speak to you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Kindly be seated. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. It has been said that all people are in pursuit of the same thing in life, contentment. However, this quest may lead us along various paths and we become engaged in diverse activities according to our interests and gifts. Some people may be industrious and save to accumulate wealth. Others may be ambitious for political power and fame. Others may develop their artistic talents and showcase them on the stage. And yet others may perform works of mercy and charity and reap great delight in doing so. In these and other strivings, humans have endeavored through the years to fulfill their thirst for contentment. The quest for contentment is something which is pursued by both the religious and the non-religious. In that regard, it may be considered an integral feature of the human experience. From the perspective of faith, the believer may view it as something that God has planted in us. The vigor which expresses itself in ambition and enthusiastic effort is the basis of all forms of our striving, whether mental, moral, or spiritual. There's the reality that some of the paths chosen to bring contentment have not always brought it in the measure in which it was anticipated. Some have accumulated wealth, others have pursued pleasure, and yet others have gone to the deserts. In each case, though there may be some satisfaction, many have found it transient and remain restless. Indeed, we might describe our restless heart in different ways. Our search for meaning, our desire for significance, our ongoing quest to be relevant. But perhaps it is in the human being, human soul longing to connect with the Creator that we find ultimate fulfillment. In the midst of our strivings, it is possible that we would discover that there is no permanent satisfaction or contentment to be gained from material pursuits. Instead, contentment is more likely to come when one discovers a balance in life, where mind, body, and spirit combine to inspire creativity, and when we give ourselves wholeheartedly in the service of others. In Paul's first letter to Timothy, he addressed the issue of men who were teaching a different doctrine, desiring to be teachers of the law, though they understand neither what they say nor about what they strongly affirm. Paul put it that way in 1 Timothy 1 verse 7. These teachers of whom Paul spoke were Gnostics and Judaizers. The former claimed to be in possession of special knowledge about Christ, and the latter insisted that Gentile converts to Judaism had to become Jews before becoming Christians. Paul also challenged the notion that godliness brought a measure of gain, profit. Paul tells us a better method to achieve real gain. The person who possesses this virtue is pleased with life 
as he or she finds it. Today we might describe such a person as centered or having his or her feet on the ground or balanced. We might also describe such a person as having right ambition. This doesn't mean that the contented person is willing to accept the unacceptable. It means that the contented person has an inner sense of security that makes it possible to proceed unafraid. It also means that the contented person is able to navigate the vicissitudes of life with due consideration for self as well as for others. The way to such contentment and genuine satisfaction starts with an acknowledgement of oneself as a creature of God. The quest for satisfaction is first and foremost the quest for God. One is reminded of St. Augustine's, St. Augustine, who like a prodigal, wondered, but eventually found satisfaction in simple yet profound terms, he exclaimed, and I quote, Thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. End of quote. While on the pilgrim path, one finds deep and abiding joys in personal relationships, the bonds of family, spouse to spouse, parents to children, friendships, collegial relationships, and love are sources of real satisfaction. Individual possessions are acknowledged and material achievements celebrated. However, there is immense satisfaction in the personal encounters which have served to create the bonds and fashion one's being. The quest for God and the kindling of the bonds of friendship are two sides of the same coin. The two quests are one and need to be pursued simultaneously. Today, as we celebrate the life, work, and service of Sir Courtney, we thank God for his contribution to our search for a better humanity. We remember with thanksgiving his integrity, commitment to his family, sense of duty, enthusiasm and energy, his prudence and foresight, and among other things, his pioneer work in establishing the Central Bank of Barbados. A rich pattern of life is complete. And for all its satisfaction, let us give God thanks and open ourselves to be comforted by God's grace. Through the years, Sir Courtney formed a mutually supportive relationship between the Central Bank of Barbados and this cathedral church. A relationship between the center of finances and the spiritual center of the Diocese of Barbados, the city and the nation. I'm pleased to say that since those early days in the mid-70s, 
that bond has remained intact and successive governors and uh, successive deans have fostered relationships for the mutual good of these two significant institutions in our land. The bond Sir Courtney established with Dean Harold Critchlow, who very much regrets his inability to be present, that bond continues today and the two institutions have continued to work collaboratively as we share this common space, so to speak, in this special part of Bridgetown. As we celebrate his legacy, I take this opportunity on behalf of the entire cathedral family to extend sincere condolences to his wife of 62 years, Gloria Lady Blackman, his sons, Keith, Christopher, and Martin, the grandchildren and siblings, Pauline, Jean, Janice, and Walwyn, we extend to you sincere condolences, thanking God for his life, a life which could easily be described as a life of contentment, a life lived out to the fullest using the gifts God had provided him with, shared sincerely with those among whom he worked and lived in the context of a loving family and sharing life as a public figure, yet one who valued the personal relationships which kept him going and which he enjoyed. May we all be inspired by Sir Courtney's example and in our quest for a better humanity, let us be mindful of the path which the Christian church offers. the path of contentment is a path that leads to union with God and service to each other. And so when our mortal remains go to the earth, Our legacy remains intact because we have established a bond with our Creator and we have established relationships with family which have flourished and which though broken by death will remain nevertheless intact because God is the giver of all life and has power over death. Once again, on behalf of the Cathedral Church, and here I include Dean Harold Critchlow and his family, I take this opportunity to extend sincere condolences to his wife, sons, grandchildren, and other siblings. Assure you of our thankfulness for his life 
and offer you our prayerful support as we now prepare to lay his mortal remains to rest. There is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. Rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord. May he rest in peace. Amen. Please stand. Let us with confidence and hope confess the faith into which we were baptized as we say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, O Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of lasting. Amen. Our intercessory prayers will be led by Mr. Samuel Maxwell, Church Warden of the Cathedral. Let us pray. You may sit or kneel, whichever is more comfortable for you. We pray for those who mourn, and especially we remember his wife, Gloria, his sons, Keith, Christopher, and Martin, his grandchildren and siblings, Pauline, Jean, Janice, and Holly. We commemorate the departed, Courtney Lulans McLaurin. My teacher, counselor, leader, administrator, and a very good friend. Let us pray with confidence to God, our Father, who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead for the salvation of all. Grant, Lord, that your servant, Courtney, may know the fullness of life which you have promised to those who love you. Lord, in your mercy. Be close to those who mourn increase their faith in your undying love. Lord, in your mercy. May we be strengthened in our faith, live and rest of our lives in fellowship with your Son, and be ready when you call us to the fullness of life. Lord, in your mercy. Show your mercy to the dying, strengthen them with hope, and fill them with the peace and joy of your presence. Lord, in your mercy. We commend all people to your unfailing love, that in them your will may be fulfilled, 
and we, we rejoice at the faithful witness of your saints in every age, praying that we share with them in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, we commend you to you, our brother Courtney, who was born by God and the Spirit in holy baptism. Grant that his death may recall to us your victory over death and be an occasion for us to renew our trust in your Father's love. Give us, we pray, the faith to follow where you have led the way, and where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. Please stand as we sing the hymn 367, Fill Thou My Life, O Lord My God.
mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father in heaven. Let us commend our brother Courtney to the mercy of God, our maker and redeemer. Deliver your servant Courtney, our sovereign Lord Christ, from all evil, and set him free from every bond, that he may rest with all your saints in eternal habitations, where with the Father and Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Into your hands, O oh merciful Savior, we commend your servant Courtney. Acknowledge we humbly beseech you a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. We sing the hymn 387, To God Be the Glory.
Lord Jesus Christ. The God of all peace, who brought again from the dead, O Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death and giving life to those in the tomb. The Son of Righteousness is gloriously risen, giving light to those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death. The Lord will guide our feet into the way of peace, having taken away the sin of the world. Christ will open the kingdom of heaven to all who believe in his name, saying, Come, O blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you. paradise may the angels lead you at your coming may the martyrs receive you and bring you into the holy city Jerusalem
short time to live. Like a flower he blossoms and then withers. Like a shadow he flees and never stays. In the midst of life we are in death, to whom can we turn for help but to you, Lord, who are justly angered by our sins? Lord God, holy and mighty, holy and eternal, holy and most merciful Savior, deliver us from the bitter pains of eternal death. You know the secrets of our heart. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Forgive us our sins, and at our last hour, let us not fall away from you. In sure and certain hope of resurrection to eternal life, through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God, our brother, Courtney, and we commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. And we beseech you in your infinite goodness to give us grace to live in your dear love and to die in your favor. That when your well beloved son shall come again in judgment, both this our brother and we ourselves may be found acceptable in your sight. Grant us for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, O Lord. Amen. Rest eternal grant unto him, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon him. May he rest in peace. Amen.
Although my God, then I an awesome wonder.
Let us pray. Merciful Father, the Lord of our life, we pray so that your people are made in your image and reflect your truth and light. We thank you for the life of your son, Courtney, for the love and mercy he received from you and showed among us. Above all, we rejoice at your gracious promise to all your servants, living and departed, that we shall rise again at the coming of Christ. And we ask that in due time we may share with our brother that clearer vision, when we shall see your face in the same Christ, O Lord, to the same Christ who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us depart in peace. Amen. Wait, okay. um, on behalf of the Black family, thank you so much for being with us today as we say farewell to our father, husband, friend, Again, thank you very much. And brothers and siblings, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate your presence here today for this wonderful tribute and send off to our father as he joins his parents and his sister in eternal peace. Thank you. Oh,